It's been a while since we've taken a look at the Russo-Ukraine war, and I figured it was time that we took another peek at it. As I've said in the past, it's very fascinating if you're someone who's interested in military history or just history in general, to be able to see a conventional war of this scale kind of unfold in real time, to look at the back and forth, the tactics, the equipment, uh, even just looking at the fog of war and what various sides say and how that lines up with reality is really fascinating. So in my last couple videos, I had said that the situation as I saw it was that Russia had suffered a series of deeply embarrassing defeats. While they didn't lose a significant portion of their army, and I didn't think it completely crippled their war effort, having to concede huge amounts of territory, uh, especially in regions that they had declared annexed, looked really bad. I harped on a lot about Kherson because it was they had annexed the Oblast or whatever they call it in the Ukraine. And it was the major city and them taking it had been a big deal. And they just kind of gave it up without a fight and withdrew across the river, uh, especially given the big mobilization and all the um, shit R Russia continues to talk. That being said, at the same time, I said that there's a counter narrative that Russia's getting everything ready for a big winter offensive. Uh, I'm not sure what the temperature is like there exactly at the moment, but that once the ground freezes, the soldiers are in position from the uh, partial mobilization, uh, the ones that have withdrawn from the other fronts. The Ukraine runs out of ammunition and their infrastructure is completely destroyed. It looks like all those things might align in the next couple months, and Russia will be in a position to launch an offensive of overwhelming force and just kind of blow through what's left of the Ukrainian army. And so those are kind of the two, I think, main narratives at this point. Maybe a bit more the pro-Ukraine side and the Western side likes to focus on the idea that Russia's burned through. Um, some of the casualty numbers I've seen them suggest for the Russians are just insane. But that the Russians aren't just running out of equipment, they've lost a significant portion of their armed forces in terms of casualties, Putin's on the verge of being overthrown in a coup, that Russia's economy is collapsing, whereas the other side will say, well, Europe's economy is collapsing, Russia is, being able, is making up its loss in revenue by trading more with China and India. And to be honest, all of these things are not mutually exclusive, they all could be true to varying levels. It could be true that Russia is preparing a major winter offensive, but it was also embarrassing how badly they got beaten in all the other parts of the country. There's also the obvious question of whether Belarus will be able to enter the conflict. All that I think would really do is just widen the front. I don't know who benefits more from a widened front at this point. Um, I'm not really sure who actually has a larger army. Generally speaking, wider fronts are better if you have a larger, more mobile army. Um, but I'm not really sure where we are exactly with that at the moment. Um, I think the Ukraine has also been kind of somewhat reluctant to invade. I mean, they could just reach the border. Are they going to invade Belarus and try to carry out regime change? So it gives Russia more locations, I guess, to fight from. But Belarus doesn't exactly have a large army. It can maybe, I think... Their standing army is like 30,000 people, which is better than nothing. But considering the partial mobilization was like 10 times that, I doubt it's going to make much of a difference. I'm not really sure how many conscripts Belarusia has to um, uh, call on, but who knows? So these are kind of the two narratives at the moment. And once again, it's very hard to know because of the fog of war and because there's so much propaganda coming from both sides. I don't know if anyone remembers the Iraqi information minister. He actually became a meme during the Iraq war because he would go on air and do what people used to call stand-up propaganda, where he'd talk about how the Iraqi army was winning, that they killed like hundreds of thousands of American soldiers, that Iraq was going to invade America. And there was all these memes, we love the Iraqi uh, information minister and stuff like that. And both sides in this war are kind of doing that. In particular, Zelensky's talking about we're going to retake Crimea somehow. We're going to retake all of the Donbass. Every single part of occupied Ukraine is going to be retaken. Uh, the U.S. is just throwing more money at them. 
And stuff is just kind of continuing on. Meanwhile, Europe is facing a massive energy crisis. Uh, inflation's going off the scale. I think inflation in Russia is actually down, from my understanding, and the economy has largely recovered. Um, so what's going? I don't know if that's something that like the pro-Russian side, because they tend to have a very rose-tinted view of reality, if that's real or not. My guess would probably be so it's probably somewhere in the middle that the sanctions hurt Russia, but they're finding ways to adapt to it. And it probably is hurting Europe more than it's hurting Russia, especially during um, the, uh, the winter season. So what the current situation really kind of reminds me of is the 1918 and World War I. And once again, this may or may not be the case. A lot of this is speculation, but it's interesting to speculate. So what happened in 1918 is America had entered the war and Russia had left the war. And this left Germany in a position where they had um, most of their army, I think there was still about a million men that were occupying various parts of Brest Litvosk. But Germany had a temporary advantage because it could bring a lot of its troops from the Eastern Front to the West. And America was starting to arrive with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of soldiers. So Germany kind of thought that they either had to win in the next couple months or they were doomed because they would not be able to match. Their army was exhausted. Uh, the blockade and various economic problems were gradually crippling their country. The Allies were only getting stronger in terms of their industry and resources with the U.S. entering, and they would soon be at a numerical disadvantage in addition to everything else. So Germany decided to do basically a YOLO offensive, which is known as the Spring Offensive which was a series of offensives that took place uh, across Western Europe. At this point in time, uh, as we can see here, the Americans didn't really have a significant number of soldiers in, or I guess it doesn't say, that's casualties. Um, but the, the Americans didn't have a substantial number of um, soldiers in the area. Now, what's interesting about it is the Germans actually took a lot of territory uh, for World War I standards which kind of is partially why I'm making a comparison to the Ukraine, because the Ukrainian counteroffensive took a lot of territory. The issue was the territory they took was strategically worthless, uh, and all it did was just widen the, the front. And as the Allies in the immediate aftermath of this would have a larger army, a wider front mostly would benefit them. Uh, so they exhausted a huge amount of resources. They theoretically drove the Allies from the battlefield, inflicted disproportionately high casualties on them, and such and such. But it completely failed at its strategic objective, and Germany was basically in no real position to resist the Western Allies once the Americans showed up with a couple million troops, and they began the, uh, the Hundred Days Offensive. So I think it's possible that this is what happened with the Ukrainian offensive, that the Russians traded land that was not strategically or tactically useful to them in exchange for time and used it as an opportunity to have the Ukrainian army over overextend itself and uh, lose uh, valuable equipment that it couldn't afford to replace. The, the overall stocks that each side has are very much a question mark. I think it's generally agreed, though, that even if Russia's weapon systems are not quite as advanced as some of the things Ukraine has, they have an immense number of tanks, uh, artillery shells, small arms ammunition, cruise missiles, all that kind of stuff. They have vastly larger stocks of these things. And while the West is giving them all this like fancy stuff that is probably better than anything the Russians have, there's very limited ammunition for it. And once it breaks, I don't really know how much they're going to be able to deal with it. Uh, another aspect of the spring offensive was the Germans lost, I think, a majority of their stormtroopers, who were their highly trained mobile uh, soldiers who, who were kind of the spearhead or the most important part of the German army. And they got completely wiped out during the spring offensive, and Germany was just never able to regain the strategic initiative in the aftermath. of it. So you might be able to see some sort of uh, parallel here that 
particularly with the partial mobilization, with the fears that the Ukraine was going to run out of weapons and ammunition, uh, they decided to basically do an all-in offensive to try to end the war, to cause regime change in Russia, to try to knock them out and maybe retake the Donbass and come to some sort of uh, negotiated treaty. That does not appear to um, have fully worked, though. As I said, they regained a lot of territory, but Russia still holds a fairly defensible position. They're very dug in in the Donbass, and uh, they're on the other side. I believe that's the Dnieper uh, River, um, and they're they're going to have to cross that if they have any hope of getting to Crimea. Uh, they've also suffered immense damage to their infrastructure, which I don't know if realistically really can be uh, repaired at this point in time. So, will this lead to a hundred days offensive? Will this lead to a scenario wherein Russia has managed to bring in, uh, in this case, the equivalent of the American reinforcements, um, and they're just going to surge forward, they're going to break through the trench warfare in uh, the Donbass and just be able to completely smash the Ukrainian army and launch offensives all along the front line. Once again, we really have no idea what the relative strength of the two armies is. I would imagine, though, that the Ukraine has probably taken, lost a much larger percentage of its um, weapon systems, particularly its functional ones. And I think they're probably about out of ammunition. There's always the question of how much left the West has to give them, and they've been pretty clear that they're willing to throw in as much as they have, but it's, it remains unseen if domestic military pressure will eventually make them stop on the grounds that they're giving up amounts of um, weaponry that they just will not be able to replace. I think kind of the last thing to put this all into context is we've very much been spoiled in the last couple decades with how long... Uh, the direct combat phase of war lasts. Like in the last couple major wars, the uh, insurgency and the asymmetric warfare lasts a long time. But in terms of like tank on tank, aircraft on aircraft, in like Iraq and Afghanistan and in similar conflicts, that did not last particularly long. Um, just the kind of open warfare. Even in Vietnam, a lot of it was asymmetric and it wasn't until the very end that the... Uh, the, uh, the North Vietnamese regulars started to kind of get involved. You could argue kind of the last major conventional war the U.S. fought was Korea. But even then, the Korean War lasted three years. I know that part of it was a stalemate, but that lasted three years. Vietnam lasted decades. Uh, world War II lasted five to six calendar years, uh, five years about six calendar years if we want to go from 39 to 45 uh, the American Revolutionary War lasted like eight years. Civil War lasted four years. A lot of these wars um, tra traditionally have lasted a lot longer. I think we're also used to, and this is relatively modern, a majority of soldiers dying due to combat, when historically it was overwhelming due to food shortages or dysentery or exposure or any number of different logistical issues. Kind of the short-term reports I've been seeing is that Russia has put everything they have into Bakhmut in the um, center of the Donbass region, and Ukraine is gradually being pushed back. And if they fall there, the whole line might collapse, and Russia might just be able to overrun a lot of it. But who knows? We've been seeing these predictions throughout. My point is just that uh, this war hasn't even lasted one year left yet, and other large-scale conventional conflicts have lasted years. Will this last three, four years? I, I doubt it, but I think we before we, and I'm guilty of this, I admit I am, declare like one side is definitively won, or momentum seems to be overwhelmingly in one side's favor, uh, that wars historically take a long time. And they're not all like, America invading Panama or Dominica or some other small country with virtually no armed forces or armed forces that are hopelessly incompetent and out of date. So that's about where we are at the moment. Uh, I hope you found that video interesting. 
Uh, God bless everybody and more content to come.